Hello there, my fellow Battle Brothers, and welcome to your weekly dose of the Space Marine Chapters lore. Today we shall return to another chapter from relatively recent history in the playlist, namely the Death Templars. Previously we learned about some of their history, and so today I wanted to change things up a bit, and go over other aspects of theirs like their fortress monastery, organization, beliefs, and combat doctrine. I am your host, the Grim Dark Narrator, and without further ado, let us proceed, shall we? The so-called Castellum Mortem, or the Fortress of Death, is the fortress monastery of the Death Templars chapter. This mighty imperial bastion is located on their planet's southern polar region, deep within the Vulcan Mountains, built into the heart of Vrykul's mightiest peak. The fortress comprises dozens of ramparts, watchtowers, and bastions. The Ceramite Ridge Mountains around it provide a great defense against conventional attack. Like other fortress monasteries, the Castello Mortem is armored and void shielded to withstand almost any kind of siege or bombardment which might befall it. Armed to repel attackers from land, air, and space, its walls bristle with enough weapons to flatten a city. In addition to the thick rock walls and adamantium gates, the chapter also utilizes many other kinds of defenses to discourage an assault. These can consist of deadfalls, grav mine nets, and hidden automated defenses. The area beyond the gates is considered hostile too, as the surrounding peaks are filled with deadly predators and inhospitable terrain. The tribes of Vrikul fear the Fortress of Death, warning their children against even straying into its shadow, lest they summon the giant sky gods to come to take them to the underworld. Once in a generation though, there are those youths who are bold enough or foolish enough to venture into the Vulcan Mountains on a spirit quest, to seek communion with the sky gods. This is not a thing to be undertaken lightly for to journey into the mountains is a death sentence otherwise. The jagged rocks can slice flesh from bone, and the erratic weather and the winds can easily kill a person from prolonged exposure. This doesn't even account for the fact that the Vulcan Mountains are crawling with deadly predators which are inimical to human life. Those who face these impossible odds without faltering and survive long enough to the point where they should have perished are then recovered by the apothecaries of the Death Templars often having succumbed but not yet died, and then revived, having been judged worthy of becoming an Astartes neophyte. This place is where the chapter safeguards its heritage and keeps its trophies of war. It is rare for more than a fraction of the chapter to be in residence at any given time, because most of the chapter companies spend years away campaigning across the Imperium. Unlike other chapters of the Astartes, the Death Templars have never once mobilized the entire chapter to fight in one specific campaign. Each battle brother has sworn an oath that their fortress monastery shall never be left undefended, and at least one company is duty bound to remain there at all times to guard it. Several times in the chapter's history, the masters of the chapter have had their loyalty questioned when the rearguard company of the Death Templars have refused the high loads of Terra requests for aid, while the rest of the chapter was out on crusade. The source of the oath is unrecorded, but imperial histories show that in the years following the Second Battle of Raikul in 398 and 37, when their sanctuary was penetrated by a force of Chaos Space Marines, the Death Templars indeed made a vow, that never again would their spiritual home be desecrated in such a manner. Within their base, the halls are studded with alcoves and shrines to the honored dead. Tiny niches are lit by delicate diffuse lights, which hold stasis-sealed vessels containing some of the chapter's holiest relics. Every portal and chamber are adorned with more skulls, and upon close inspection one realizes these are not carved or fashioned by human hand. All of them are real, bleached human skulls made dusty by age. Along many of the fortress's walls are what appear to be seated figures running along its length. Just like the skulls, these are not actually statues carved from the stone of Castellum Mortem, but preserved human corpses. These are not simple corpses though. The seated figures are the preserved bodies of fallen battle brothers who died in glorious combat, and now reside at the right hand of the Emperor. 
The monastery's reclusium is similarly filled with memento mori, but with the skulls and bones of the chapter's many enemies claimed in the aftermath of victory upon hundreds of battlefields. The Death Templars are rumored to have a similar organizational structure to the Black Templars. But after their defeat at the hands of Karn the Betrayer at the beginning of the 13th Black Crusade, their numbers were reduced to just under 500 marines. The Death Templars originally had a scattered deployment, with Battle Brothers crusading all across the galaxy. However, after the formation of the Great Rift, the chapter was forced to withdraw, regroup, and consolidate their remaining forces. Their Librarius and Reclusium also took heavy casualties in the Black Crusade and were nearly wiped out. Fortunately, with the resurrection of Gilliman, the launching of the Indomitus Crusade, the numbers of the Death Templars were reconstituted with the introduction of the new Primaris Marines. These warriors were quickly inducted into the chapter's various companies and brought them back to full strength. As the Death Templars began to forge new and glorious deeds in the annals of Imperial history, these newly inducted brothers would prove their worth hundreds of times over, as they slaughtered their enemies with the same cold, calculating savagery of a true Death Templar Astartes. Their skills in the arts of death soon earned them the moniker of Moritat, from the ancient words Mori meaning deadly and Tat meaning deed. The Death Templars, like other chapters of the Astartes, do have their own unique cult belief system, martial philosophy and variations of the Imperial cult. Specifically, they practice a mortuary cult belief system, indigenous of their home of Vrykul. It is looked upon as a more extreme variety of beliefs by the more conservative elements of the Adeptus Ministorum. The Death Templars embrace their homeworld's feral beliefs of the God Emperor in the manifestation of the Imperator Mortifex, the supreme judge of the souls of the dead and keeper of martyrs. Accordingly, they see themselves as preordained killers, living manifestations of the angels of death consumed with the never-ending job of bringing death to those who defy the will of the Emperor or seek to thwart his holy purpose. The chapter's tenet belief is that life is transient and that the manner of a warrior's death is all that matters. Their doctrine demands that the fallen are honored beyond even the living, and no warrior is held to have truly served until he passed away. Thus, the Castellum Mortem resounds through the ages with the mournful dirges of past heroes sung by the chapter serfs. These chants constantly emanate throughout, echoing in the walls of the massive fortress, ensuring that the hero's memories live on. The strange and elaborate funerary customs observed by outsiders is looked upon with some trepidation, as many Astartes find the Death Templar's fascination with death itself as rather distasteful. It is commonplace for brothers of the chapter to decorate their armor with the bones and skulls of worthy enemies, as well as carrying small reliquaries containing the ashes of a fallen comrade. The display of such grisly adornments of hanging bones lends the brothers of the chapter a fearsome aspect indeed, a practice calculated to deepen the terror sown in the hearts of their foes. Some detractors darkly whisper, although always out of earshot, that the Death Templars have also taken to using the crushed bones of their foes as lapping powder for the battle plate. The genetic curse in the chapter's gene seed manifests differently in the Death Templars than in other scions of Dorne. It is known as the Call to Darkness. Often, some battle brothers will display suicidal urges and a blatant disregard for overall combat doctrine. Gathered together in specialist units called Death Seekers, these battle brothers operate independently on the field of battle, often employed as efficient shock assault troops and assassins. The Lord Marshal will sometimes utilize these afflicted brothers to undertake suicidal missions in the Zone Mortalis, from which they are not expected to return. These brothers will undertake these missions willingly, to rid themselves of the dark visions plaguing their every waking moment, and to sell their lives dearly in service of their beloved Emperor. The Death Templars have followed the same fighting style throughout all their millennia of existence. They are well known for their skill at arms and close-range pack tactics. Their companies have a tendency towards aggressive and decisive spaceborne and planetary assault actions, utilizing highly mobile units. 
This usually results in actions in which dedicated assault units, including their death knights and wraith squads, close with the weakest point of the enemy position at the earliest opportunity under covering fire. Then they are supported by mounted tactical units and armored forces to exploit the breakthrough. This then allows the assault units to carry on into successive enemy positions behind the front line, preventing an organized response. The rest of the units then conduct a mop-up of the remaining enemies and move into positions of support, pinning down the next target with all available firepower. And this, my friends, has been what I wanted to tell you about the Death Templars chapter and some of their peculiarities for today. I might be mistaken here, but the first thing that comes to mind in comparison to these guys is the Mortifactors chapter an actual canon chapter. They too are sort of obsessed with death and decorate their base with skulls and shrines and whatnot. Curiously, those guys are scions of the Ultramarines though. Anyway, as always, I look forward to reading more on your thoughts on these guys in the comments below. If you enjoyed the lore of the chapter, I can also return in the future with a third episode on them. Maybe the biggest joy of these homebrew chapters is that, ironically, they have a lot more lore written for them than even some well-known canon chapters. Anyway, thanks for watching, and the Emperor protects.